In the name of the loving, liberating, life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I was in sixth grade at Del Mar Middle School, unlocking my bike from the bike rack, when I heard a friend shout that President Reagan had just been shot. For me, it was one of those moments where you will always remember exactly where you were when you heard the news. And I suspect I may also remember where I was yesterday when I learned of the apparent assassination attempt of the former president. These are moments, I think, for all of us, both as Americans and as Christians, to mark with great solemnity, prayer, and reflection. As it's been said over and over by leaders on both sides of the aisle, such violence has absolutely no place in our democratic process or any other place for that matter. And yet here we are again. And though we don't yet know the details of this incident, I think there is no question that we have all witnessed the steady decay, the steady decline of civility in our public discourse. We have conditioned ourselves to sit through and experience year-round campaigns that no longer talk seriously about issues or policy, but spend nearly all their efforts painting the other side as totally unacceptable, so completely un-American, even criminal, that their election would be utterly catastrophic. So that in our echo chamber, as far as we're concerned, no sane person would even consider voting for them. All of which is both amplified and multiplied by a 24-7, multi-billion dollar political news and commentariat industrial complex not to mention the social media environment and its rampant toxicity. They all are making billions, hyping the latest outrage, the latest grievance, scandal, conspiracy, getting wealthy on our clicks, making money on our animosity. And it's no surprise that study after study shows us to be more divided, more partisan, more prone to demonize, and according to a recent CNN poll, more recent to tolerate violence in order to defeat the other side. And yet Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. How can we be peacemakers in the days and the months to come? How can we stand in the face of such overwhelming division and conflict? What can we do to lower the temperature and start to maybe heal rather than add to the animosity? It seems to me that as Americans and as Christians, as stewards of the world's longest standing functioning democracy, all of us, regardless of our political affiliations, need to not just pray for peace, and pray we will, but to also commit to practicing peace. Former President Barack Obama and George W. Bush called on all Americans last night to recommit ourselves to a more civil discourse, and I agree. And I wonder, I wonder if the place to begin might be with our language. In our baptismal covenant, we commit to respecting the dignity of every human being. And that begins, I think, with the words we use, particularly 
the use of dehumanizing language. Psychologists will tell us that describing people as vermin, as pigs or monsters, or using the language of disgust or infestation, over time, increases our willingness to tolerate suffering, suffering and cruelty toward those who are targeted. And history bears this out. We know this. The humanizing language has always preceded, has always enabled bigotry and prejudice, and in time made violence more acceptable. And it's contagious. When one of us uses vitriol, there's a, res- there's a tendency to respond in kind, to even up the ante. A study two years ago found 85% of Democrats and Republicans consider the members of the other party as less evolved than they are. And so it should not surprise us that up to 25% of both parties would support violence if they lost. We need to stop using such language, such language ourselves, and stop tolerating it from those around us, and most especially from our political leaders. We need to demand a higher standard. Rather than just turn the channel or defriend them, we need to start insisting that when they disagree, they do so without demonizing. But we need to not only to stop dehumanizing each other, we need to start rehumanizing our fellow Americans as well. Which means we may need to stop avoiding political conversations for a while and instead start to engage in them, but to do so differently than as we might have in the past. Rather than argue and debate, we need to start entering into them with grace so that we might make room to build relationship, understanding, trust. We have to be willing to meet people where they are and assume they're going to stay there. Because it can't be about convincing them or changing their mind. We need to begin by first seeing them seeing them and connecting with the image of God within them. Rather than write them off, we need to recommit ourselves to the hard work of listening. Listening not to correct, not to convince, but to understand, to hear where they are coming from and discover some of their story that might have got them there. Which means... We're going to have to put down some of our arguments for a while. We may have to put down our ego, our perspective, long enough to begin to enter into theirs. Not to gather ammunition for a rebuttal, but to truly disarm long enough to hear their story and to connect with the human being behind it. Finally, it seems to me, that we must condemn all violence and the hatred that fuels it. Our gospel story today is a graphic story of violent retribution by a political leader who could not tolerate dissent. We must refuse and disavow all forms of violence, retributive violence, violent language, and violent imagery in our discourse. As Dr. King said, returning hate only multiplies hate. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence in a descending spiral of destruction. And he would know. 
If we are to be peacemakers, we cannot contribute to that spiral. We can't contribute to that escalation any longer. And we must be the first to disarm if we must. That's what Jesus means when he says, love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. It doesn't mean we have to like them. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. But it does mean we cannot deny them their humanity. We can't give up on them. We can't give up on their chance for redemption because God doesn't give up on us either. Being peacemakers means doing whatever we need to do to find some common ground, whatever common ground we can, even in the midst of our disagreements. Because no matter how profound we think they are, no matter how important they may actually be, they too are someone's child. They too are someone's mother. They too worry about the future. They have concerns about their health. They too struggle with finances and stay up late worrying about their children. They too are just in need of the love and compassion as the rest of us. When, uh, when Joe and I moved to Michigan, <laughs> I remember our realtor made what I thought was a, a really odd point about our soon-to-be neighbors. Their politics, she said, it's gonna be about 100% opposite from yours, I'm warning you. <laughs> I guess they were kind of known in the community for their activism. And so when we first met, you know, you could tell there was some feeling out going on. Where did they stand? They made small talk by floating some trial balloons, sharing the latest outrage that was being peddled on their favorite cable news channel. But we didn't bite. We focused instead on learning their story. And they asked about ours. We talked about families, their life in LA, talked about our past careers. They shared some struggles about a family member. I put them in touch with a friend when they needed a probate lawyer. We invited them to our girl's birthday party and they brought a really nice bottle of wine. <laughs> I asked if she could watch our girls one day when I was in a pinch. And the three of them had an absolute blast together. When COVID hit, I offered to help with runs to the store as she had a pretty severe pre-existing condition. Joe started to cut their kid's hair out on the porch. And they offered us their cabin in case we needed to get away. Today, we have an open door policy with our respective tools in our garage and our girls an open invitation to visit. And last year, they asked me to bless their marriage on their 25th anniversary. Do we still disagree politically? <laughs> Absolutely. But the people our realtor once warned us about, I now consider friends. Who I would not hesitate to trust my children with. And if it seems like this is a tall order, if it feels way out of your comfort zone, trust me, you are better at this than you think. Because each week, we practice setting aside those very kinds of differences so that we can all come together around that table where we kneel shoulder to shoulder, bound together not by common beliefs, not by common opinions, trust me on that, but by a common kneel and a common bond as fellow children of God. Can we not reclaim that? We practice it here. Why? So we can do it out there. 
Perhaps, perhaps it's time for us to leave our echo chambers and to go out of our way to connect with those who believe differently, to set down our arguments and our judgments long enough to truly listen and to discover that while we may not agree and perhaps never will, they are indeed part of one human family and have been all along. And in doing so, take some small step, one person at a time, toward a new civility, one that will make this country more safe, more peaceful, more just, more united. Not red states, not blue states, but a united states for our children, for our children, and for theirs. Amen. Amen.